Boy, they must be scared of you. They quiet right away. You're the still most intimidating guy I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, either that or Susie's really getting a lot of attention. <laughs> and nobody knows who the character is on the end. So, uh, so anyways, welcome to uh, Someone Yale. Someone gave me a mic and I came yeah, up. No. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. I'm a student here. You, you do have a lot to learn. <laughs> I admit that. So welcome to Yale. Welcome to Yale School of Management and uh, this terrific event with Susie and Jack Welch. Uh, I, I was just asking Jack about his schedule with Susie and uh, they're doing three television events today. And then they're going to some school in Philadelphia. And then sometime in the very near future, they're going to hit two business schools up in Boston. But we're delighted that Susie and Jack decided that they should start out in terms of their business school promotion of their new book, The Real Life MBA, here at Yale School of Management. So let's welcome Susie and Jack Welch. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, I'm not going to go through my long introduction because it would delay matters, but, uh, but Susie, of course, many of you know, she, she went to the Harvard Business School, editor of Harvard Business Review, worked for Bain, um, Jack uh, ran this small conglomerate, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and Together, they've been engaged with teams and uh, businesses and enterprises all around the world, uh, collaborating on all kinds of interesting projects. Uh, they're building an online business school. They've co-authored together. This is their latest book uh, that's substantially different in interesting ways from other books, uh, like Straight from the Gut, winning. Um, and um, so we're, we're in for a, a really interesting discussion. Now, why is this guy in the end here? Uh, Noel Tishy is my former colleague from, from University of Michigan. And uh, he is one of the leaders in the, if, I think, the, the preeminent guy in, in action learning. And I learned a lot from Noel when I was a person who just you know, shifted around supply and demand curves. And uh, I had to actually run programs, and Noel was the person who actually helped me understand the participants' experience. And he would push people so hard. And one of the things that he basically ta taught me was get people off the sidelines. Make sure that everybody has to develop their own point of view and get in the mix. He happened to also run this thing called Crotonville, which was GE's educational f facility, at which was, I think Jack would say, instrumental in the success of GE. So that's, that's a very sh short abbreviated, forgive the abbreviated introduction, but I didn't want to have this go too long. You forgot like Noel's biggest uh, 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 achievement. <laughs> yes. He introduced me and Jack. Well, there. <laughs> By far, number one. I've I've heard I've heard stories to the effect that two of you sometimes call them up and say, "Why didn't you introduce us no, earlier?" Yeah, earlier, yeah, earlier for yeah, sure. Earlier, yeah. Yes. Uh, earlier, yes, earlier. Ten years earlier would have been good. Yeah. So, so Susie, I'm going to start with you. So. Uh, first, a preface. When, when I first um, had an interaction with Jack Welch, uh, I had this, this line that actually helped me a lot because you know, basically you know, the, the bottom part of the line was, so everybody calls you Jack, why? And you know, I knew what his answer would be. He hates BS. He hates bureaucracy. And I said, well, you can call me Dean Snyder. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> By virtue of your association with Jack, mm -hmm. you're identified as Susie. Yes. And 
is that comfortable for you? Have you bought into this, you know, everybody gets to call you Susie and, and you know, just there, there, there's no... What the hell else? There's no you know, actually, This reminds me of a story um, of when, uh, when I first met Jack 15 years ago and he had a place down in Florida and it was part of a country club. I'd never been part of that world. And um, I got a tennis lesson and the tennis instructor said, may I call you Susie? And I literally said to him, what else would you call me? <laughs> you know, I, I didn't understand. There was also this sort of Mrs. Welch or whatever there was. But in, in any case, I, I bought into it. You know, uh, just to get existential on you, I mean, there, uh, there's just a lot of stuff that comes along with being with Jack and, and, and uh, um, being called Susie and just sort of being part of a, uh, you know, I remember somebody w once said, you got a brand, Jack and Susie, and I was like, I, whoa, I grew up and became a brand. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, all, it's all good. It, is this something that, as you have bought into this, that it actually um, ties into feedback? That, that um, it actually does encourage people to be more open with you and also as you observe the interactions with Jack where people are, are more likely to say, you know, Susie, I, here's what's going on. Well, um, I myself for a while was a columnist for O, Oprah's magazine, and to tell you the truth, writing for that magazine and having my column there. Um, I, uh, I learned being on the, t on the talk circuit after that is that people come to meeting you um, already feeling like they know you and as, you, as if you're friends. You know, you've been in their heart by writing and, and they come to you. And, and so I love that. I mean, I, I love it. I love immediate intimacy with people. That's, and that's what Jack has. I mean, that's what informality does in a company. And that's what informality does in life in general is it just sort of cleans it all out and allows you to get right down to it, you know, just clear out the detritus and have the real conversation the first time instead of building up to it. So I, I, personally, I, I think the whole world would be better if it, and business would be much, much better if that happened. Is there any time when it's like people just can't bring themselves to it? To be real? No, but call you Susie. Like outside the US or different situations. In Asia. To, yeah. In Asia, but then they call me Miss Susie. <laughs> okay. Just sort of big. So, so Jack, um, and I'm gonna no get ready for for the heavy ammo. So, so Jack, um, winning still is featured in the book. Tell me how your thoughts about winning have have changed, evolved over the years. You've always been a really competitive person. And winning matters. And uh, you, you've tied this back into not just personal success, but you've got to win in order to do other things. So take it from there. Well, look, you, in order to do good, you've got to do well. And if you don't put that package together, look, I, it started for me years ago in, in competitive stuff when I was cut, captain of hockey teams and stuff like that as a kid. Golfing all the time was a, was a passion. But basically, who wants to be in the losing locker room versus the winning locker room? Business is a game. It's a game like every other game. It's a game like baseball, football, anything else. The team that feels the best players wins, and winning is more fun than losing. And when you win, people win. You spread it. Everyone wins. In GE, for example, the stock went up 5,000% over 20 years, and 65,000 people had stock options. And what a turn on it was to see their success everywhere. And they felt it. They felt like owners. They were winning. It was a, it's exciting as hell. But, but as I was talking to a student the other day here who happened to have a class outside of Yale SOM went over to, to one of our sister professional schools and the faculty members said on the second day of the course, capitalism is evil. <laughs> wow. Wash your mouth, that was so cool. So you're winning at something that's evil. And the problem is he's probably got tenure too. <laughs> so, so defend. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I want some old time religion here. Defend capitalism. Well, we've tried other systems. 
and this turns out to be the best so far, and you want to go country by country, this is the best game in town. And today, with all of our troubles, it's the best game in town. Susie and I have been out in the last two weeks in the pre-book launch before the Today Show and all that stuff. We were at South by Southwest. We were at uh, one spot in Jacksonville, where the other one was in Austin. There you've got all these young entrepreneurs. We had a crowd of 8,000 uh, in the stadium at, at, in, uh, in, in Austin. And money was meeting young kids with ideas. It's the most exciting thing you can ever see. So if, if you haven't been to South by Southwest, no matter what your age, you gotta get there. You gotta see it and feel it, it vibrates. And there are these kids pitching their stories. And there are these VCs and people with money. Now at Jacksonville, it was 280,000 people. There were kids in rooms pitching stuff. Not to VCs, they haven't got the brand yet that South by Southwest has. They have people with money, pri private foundations, private, uh, private investors, and they're matching them up. There's no country in the world that does that. To see this enthusiastic young people coming together with people with money and make, making that match, making a bet, and, and going for it. Nothing's better. Nothing is better. So if you haven't been there to, to those, those things, if you get an idea, it's a great place to go to crowdsource and get funding. I think we had something like that here Thursday. Did you? Yeah, it was cool. Not that scale, but no, don't dive in. Well, I was getting ready for today saying, what's, what's my journey been like with, uh, with Jack? And uh, just to give you a flavor of, of, of Jack, I finished a book in 1984 called Transformational Leader. Jack said, I won't interview on it with you. And finally, I got an interview, which led to him asking me, would I come and run GE's Crotonville? And I said, absolutely not. I'm going to go to INSEAD for a year. Uh, and long story short, three months later, I'd moved to Connecticut, and I took a two-year <laughs> leave of absence and ran Crotonville. I said, I need a job description. What do you want me to do, Jack? Sitting in his office in New York City, he says, I want an effing revolution. <laughs> That's it. And he meant it. And what we did is we broke down. Crotonville was born in the late 50s. It was the uh, Harvard AMP program. It was actually modeled off the first uh, GE program, 13-week program, planning, organizing, implementing, measuring. Very bureaucratic MBA. He wanted something different, so he supported me all the way of sending teams off to Southeast Asia looking for acquisitions, joint ventures. We put it on an action learning platform. And, uh, and that was the beginning of an incredible journey with Jack. And since then, uh, we've obviously stayed friends, and uh, I gave him some of that revolution. But I, I want to fast forward to today, because this is vintage Welch. In the Daily oh, Mail be, yesterday. Uh -oh, spaghetti yep. Why should lay quote Jack Welch? Why should lazy professors get fat on money while kids are going broke? You, the kids, faculty, self included. That's Jack's quote from yesterday, right? Last night. <laughs> Last night. So I as a as a fat professor here, <laughs> what what do you mean by that? Look, I, I, I've started an MBA school. We're up to 900 students. We've grown 40% a year. And we're taking people not fresh out of college or five years out of college. We're taking people in a company for 15 or 20 years. And they're getting a on, fully online MBA. Uh, but guess what? The customer is the student. And everybody that teaches here or anywhere else has got to ask faculty, advisors, deans, et cetera, who is your customer? Too often, the faculty is the customer and not the student. Our students are polled twice a semester as to the effectiveness of the learning process they're in. If they, there is no tenure, so if the faculty ends up getting bad marks a couple times, the faculty's gone. 
the faculty evaporates. And that is fundamentally a change model. And we, 20 people in a class, their obligation is to teach those students. Now, you have armies of great teachers here, and I'm sure that's not a big, big issue. But in too many schools, the faculty is the customer and not the student, and that's what I was talking about. And we got a vicious cycle. The government gives loans, the loans go to the school, the school gets the salaries, and they pack it on to the unionized faculty, usually. It stinks. <laughs> the model's wrong. The model's got to get, we got to get education delivered in a more cost-effective value proposition. And you, you were, I was lucky enough to sit, sit in on your talk this morning, and Yale is, is moving that way. More and more thinking about online, whether it be MOOCs or other things. And that has to be the way of the future. We can't have the old model where the faculty yells at the student, the student regurgitates it back, then they graduate. That, that ain't the game. And I think we've got to change it. Yeah, th that's my opportunity to make note of the fact that, th that this is a global network event. I wanted to welcome uh, friends and students, faculty from the 26 other global network schools. So everything that you say about fat faculty is not only offending <laughs> faculty here, <laughs> but we this, covered them all. <laughs> you've just hit, you know, I'm multiple not, continents. Not, <laughs> look, that's a, that's a very well done phrase that's so true. Never listen to anybody who's over seven and under 70. The only people who li listen to are below seven <laughs> and above 70. They have no filter. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's the way it is. You've never had a filter, Jack. <laughs> so, I, don't, I don't buy that. I don't know when he had a filter, so. <laughs> so, right. so um, Susie, as you're promoting this book, what, what ends up being the most compelling reasons for people to read this book? Well, not everybody can come here. I mean, not everybody can go to a leafy business school or, uh, and, and take the two years and uh, go to a leafy campus. And some people have to stay at work or want to stay at work. And, and uh, they want just the kind of, um, you know, they've thought to themselves, I need an MBA, or I wish I had an MBA, or I'm not getting, uh, you know, I'm missing some, um, uh, that 360 mindset that you need to run a business. I, I know a lot about finance, but I don't know about, I don't even know what to ask when I'm at the marketing table. And so, so um, we were not planning to write another book. We wrote Winning, then we had a companion book to Winning. We were very, very busy. We write columns, we do a lot of stuff, and we weren't gonna do this, but then uh, Jack um, has become so incredibly passionate about his school, and he was thinking a lot about MBAs, and what should an MBA have in it, and then I, I think one day, honestly, I think that we were, we may have just actually imbibed slightly and we're feeling very loosey-goosey, and the words, um, the real life MBA popped out of my mouth, and that was the end of that, because once we realized it could be in a book, so that's, you know, that wh that's why we wrote it, and then uh, uh, when we started to think about all the different things we'd heard, traveling, this sort of hunger to say, you know, what happens when you get whacked? How do you get out of a, a, a career stall? I mean, there's just a lot of questions people have at work, and wanted to, you know, uh, codify and put it in one place. Well, we've talked to a million people in the last 10 years in crowds like this, small and large, as, as, as many as 50,000, as, as small as 50. And we've gone around the world to small companies. We, we have a private equity company. We do all this stuff. And we think we know what's frustrating people. If you look at the last Gallup poll, 35% of the American workforce is engaged. That's it, 35. Think of that number. You go into the battle, and 65% of your team is on the sidelines. They've been running this poll since 08. The number has, has, has not improved much at all. We just saw some statistics this morning from another poll that's coming out that we can't tell you what the name of it is, but you'll see it. Their number is 18% are engaged in the workforce. What this MBA in a book tells you is how to engage employees, how to get them in the game, how to get in their hearts and minds, and how to 
make yourself the chief meaning officer. That's your job when, when you get out as a, as a, as a leader. You, you become chief meaning officer. You've got to make purpose in everyone's life when they get up in the morning and come to work. And you've got a real job to do that. You've got to turn them on. You've got to excite them. You have to have a ge generosity gene. We have, we have seen over the years the one common denominator of, le of leaders with su sustainability uh, a ge is a generosity gene. People who love to give praise, who love to see people grow, who don't steal ideas from one and take it to the other, who when they give a raise, they're turned on. And when they, and when they give somebody stock options or stock, they, they can't be more excited. And when somebody gets promoted, they're absolutely in their group, they love it. They don't hide that good person. They want to see them grow. If you think about the bosses you've had in your life, the good and bad, everybody here, the good ones had a generosity gene. They got into your soul and they cared about you and they took you to new levels. And that's so true. And this book talks about how to do that, right. how to engage the team, how to deal with this terrible grind since 08 that's, that's encompassed company after company. It's just too many people think that work is a grind. And not for you guys. You guys are going to get out and have great jobs. You're going here. But you're going to enter into organizations where a lot of your colleagues and the people who work for you uh, are consider work a grind. And it's your job to take the grind out of it. It's a game. And you want to make it fun. And, and you want to make people feel great about what they're doing, give meaning to it. And, and, and that's really imperative to create these organizations where the two things that define them are truth and trust. You know, this, that we speak the truth here. We seek the truth here. No spin. We are all about finding the truth. And then also that we have an environment of complete trust up and down and sideways, creating those organizations. That's the task. We have, uh, together, we've got 75 years of experience about writing about leadership, who, what, what's a leader, what does a leader do, passionate, and all these things you've read about a thousand times. But leadership 2.0, leadership today, are two words, as she said, as Susie said, truth and trust. It should be in every conference room, in every meeting room, a flashing light. Is, there, is only truth here, or is it spin? Are we, are we negotiating a budget with me in with a low number, and you in with a high number, pulling us together like a dentist? Uh, <laughs> it, you know, it, it, what is it like? Is, is the truth here? But you will only get truth if you've got trust. And you build trust all the time, every day, when you treat a certain person a certain way, when you uh, have somebody's back when things are tough, you build that trust. And when you have to let, oh, let somebody go, you love them as much on the way out as you love them on the way in. When you walked around the halls introducing your new hire and how excited you were for them, and six months later, later you treat them like a leper, and you're walking around like this, you know, you're not hugging them anymore, and you want them to go away. Have you ever seen a headline in the New York Times or the Journal, happy whistleblower complains. <laughs> Never saw a happy whistleblower. Those two words don't go together. <laughs> so when you love them on the way out, it's your mistake. You hired them. It's not their, their mistake. Charlie Rose says, said something yesterday on the CBS morning show. As, as we had a tape piece for about eight minutes, he got off and he said, you know, when I talked to Jack, at lunch, he always told me that any employee who is surprised because they got let go is the manager's fault, the, the leader's fault. He owes that. We find when we go around that 10 and, and maximum 15% know where they stand in the company. Knowing where you stand is an obligation of any leader. No one should come in to work where they're looking up and saying, oh, I think the boss is mad today. Oh, an eye roll kills you for the day. We have two children that are, are working now that are, they live on the eye rolls. They're in their early 20s, they're in their first jobs. And, they, and if, if the boss does this with a shoulder move or an eye move or any other move, they call their mother. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's incredible. And they don't know, that one got a raise in the mail. Right. And we sat her in to find out what it was, 
And, and they but said she merit. She was scared to go because of the atmosphere in the organization. She was scared to go ask her boss why she got a raise. And you have us as parents, it's a problem because we said, you've got to go find out why you got a raise so you can do more of it. <laughs> no, 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 no. Finally, she went in and, and the boss said to her, merit. And so she reported to us dutifully, he said merit. We said, that's all he said? <laughs> but unfortunately, that's corporate America. And you people, as you think about your jobs going forward, you got to change that. You got to become transparent. You got to let everything out there. And you got to let people know. Here's what I like about what you're doing. I used to do it four times a year, little cards. Here's what I like about what you're doing. Here's what you can do to improve. That's a big deal. Handwritten. Handwritten. Yeah. So, uh, what, excuse me what, for going on. No, no, no. Excuse me. So what, so what you're getting, for those of you who haven't read the, the, the set of books, is absolute focus on people. So when you read Jack's stuff, Susie's stuff, it's not strategy comes first, and then the financial framework, and evaluate the competition, and, and figure out the right organizational structure and capital structure, blah, blah. It's, it's, you know, the HR person and the HR focus is way more important than the CFO and the financial focus. It's about the people. It's about building the team. So uh, if you look at this book, you'll see the same thing. What I want to ask now is, how is it different? We have... We have uh, a great crowd here. We've got people all around the world. I would say a big percentage of them are trying to do more than one thing at the same time. They're distracted. They're over-calendared. Their schedules are crazy. They're thinking about you know, their kids, how to juggle things. And that engagement has got to be tougher. It's more global. You, you've got time zone issues, you've got cultural issues, you've got much more diversity, you've got groupism, you've got all kinds of stuff. How, how does this focus on people in today's world have to change? Well, what, what works? I'm going to add to the list of all the things you said. I mean, I, I always say, talk about you know, doing a couple things at one time, I, I, my constant refrain is, I am multitasking beyond my capacity, because that's what it feels like all day long. Um, we're all doing that. Uh, we have a chapter in the book. I, 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 some of you, all of you will be familiar with that old, old share song, Gypsies, Tramps, and Thieves. And we've got a chapter in the book which we sort of take a play on that. It's called Geniuses, Tramps, and Thieves. And it's about the three different kinds of new um, uh, groups that you're, you're managing now. And by geniuses, we mean that people whose work you don't understand and you couldn't do yourself. And it used to be that when you got to be the top, you had done all the jobs on the way up. I mean, I came up through the ranks as a reporter, and by the time I was promoted to be head of a magazine, I had done all the jobs underneath me. But those days are, are over, and that you can be a CEO and have 50 coders working for you, and you can have no idea what they are doing all day, or you can have financial geniuses working for you. So we talk a lot about that challenge in the book and, and understanding that you're looking at whether or not the end customer is satisfied, That's it, and, and getting in their skin and knowing them as human beings and having the right values. The second well, group- Let me jump in on that okay. one. Okay. Because I like, I like this story. We were out in California with our daughter, and her iPhone wasn't working, so we went to the Apple store, to the Genius Bar, to uh, get it fixed. And uh, there was this very cute guy there, so she was quite interested in him. Yeah, we could have we were, spent the whole day there. We spent, <laughs> we, we, we spent about an hour and a half getting this thing uh, done. But uh, they, they, they were having this conversation, and then we had a chance to talk to the, to the guy, this Apple salesman, BA in English from Berkeley. And we said, how You're managing 35 geniuses. Geniuses. How do you, how the hell do you manage these people in the back room? He said, I don't have the foggiest idea what they do. He said, but I do know one thing. I know what the customers look like when he brings the device back and they go out the door. My measurement is smiling Apple customers out the door who come in with a broken device. That's my job. And how they do it in the back, 
So with all the big data and all the stuff you'll see, and I, and I have CEOs coming into me all the time with their big data plans, <laughs> it's not big data. Data is only useful when you say, why are we doing it? What is the outcome of, this, of these data that we are going to act on to change the game? So it's, again, you don't have to know how to get big data, but you have to ask the right questions about outcomes. Where, what are we driving for with all these data? Um, okay, so the second, the second, the second group is, uh, we call them tramps. We mean it in the nicest possible way, but it's people who work remotely. And that is an ever larger group of people. Um, and either they're freelancers who just come to you for the work, they're project-based, or, they uh, or they are people who work uh, not within your site. And I mean, I, when I was running HBR, I just had everybody in the office. And those days are over, everybody in the office, especially in, in fields that, where people can be really mobile. Yeah, Managing them is a different and unique challenge. It's a modern challenge, and it's only going to grow and grow. And uh, there's a lot of ways to mitigate against that, interestingly, and maybe I, I, paradoxically, using technology. But you just can't let them float out there remotely and just keep your fingers crossed. You've got to do everything in your power as a manager to make them part of the team and make the team uh, coalesce. And so then the final uh, uh, group that we talk about, we call them thieves. And, and really where we go with this is not the people who um, steal from you, uh, because we think that actual number of people who have lack integrity is, is glancingly small. But really the biggest thief in organizations since 2008, that's fear. That's fear. Because people are scared. They're scared of layoffs. They're scared of downsizing. They're scared of their industry changing overnight because of an acquisition or a change in technology and themselves becoming irrelevant. And you have to manage fear. fear. You have to manage fear like you manage people. And you've got to name it, own it, identify it, say there's an elephant in the room. It's everyone's scared. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about what you really should be scared of, because I'm scared too, and what you shouldn't be scared of, because that's just gossip. We're hmm. going to find out who's gossiping. So uh, that's new. That's part, along with everything else you mentioned, which is the globalization, speed, all that stuff. That's all the, the, these three groups. And they really matter, these geniuses, tramps, and this thief component. But we, much we of this can, can be brought back to transparency. You got to think transparent all the time because everybody in your organization knows anything, everything anyway. Yeah. The idea there are secrets and you know a little more because you're a manager, quote, is nonsense. Everybody knows everything now. So lay it out, talk to your team. Everybody's on the same page. It's a big deal. All right. So I suspect not, well, I, I know there are questions out here. I'm going to just quickly open it up to questions. Noel, you can help moderate. Um, I'm, I think that Tim has a, a mic, and we've got a mic here. And so who? If you could raise your hand if you'd like to ask Susie Jack a question. Let's start right here. Okay. And then is there someone else who would like yeah, Are you giving the Mercedes as you usual yeah, right. for the first question? Okay. Yeah, you got it. No, I really put pressure on the last question, okay. but go ahead. Uh, thanks for coming very much. I'm a uh, GE grad and spend some time on FMP and audit staff, so great to be here uh, with you guys. Um, one thing that was really impressive to me at GE was Crotonville. And it's great that we have the creator here as well. And particularly HR, I was really impressed. I've worked a few other places, and HR is kind of this mm -hmm. nebulous yeah. group that you kind of question the picnics and in the parties. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then similarly, leadership. I've worked at other places that would go on about leadership, and I just kept thinking, you know, God, you know, Crotonville felt right. Like what? You can wax on about candor and, and being honest, but like, what really differentiated the leadership curriculum at, at Crotonville that we could kind of maybe incorporate to some of our curriculum here? Well, now, no, I think so. Noel, no, do you want to talk to that? Crotonville was born in the late 50s with a bunch of Harvard professors putting together blue books that look like encyclopedia. Yeah. To plan, organize, integrate, measure. And it was teaching bureaucracy all the way up to 1981 when he took over and he realized that Crotonville and, and people, it was a hodgepodge by then. Some people were sent there as outplacement. Some were, we don't know what to do with Ted this uh, year, we'll send him to Crotonville. And some were high potential, it was a mess. Intuitively he knew that's where you get to the heart and soul of people. And so he started a journey, and I started getting involved with Crotonville, and he said, 
want you to come full time. And I took a two year leave of absence. We blew up all the traditional, we're not gonna read case studies. Any faculty member from that school up in Cambridge that wants to come down here and read a case and work a case that's 10 years old, goodbye. We're gonna send teams off to Southeast Asia for a couple weeks looking for acquisitions, joint ventures. He'll be there with the top team to hear the report outs. Now you gotta build a team. Now you gotta prepare them to do an assessment of business opportunities. Then you gotta come back and put it all together and take the heat of the senior people really testing it. That, that was how, and once you started that ball rolling, Crotonville becomes an action learning platform, not a boring, you know, corporate university quote. I mean, just to add on that a little bit, is that one of the things I've noticed that Jack has stolen from that to put into the new program is that you use the academic setting to create a safe place for people to take real life risks. Okay, so you can do things that it would be very risky out in the real world with the safety net of the school underneath you and you, and you, and you roll out. I don't know if you're doing that here, I bet you are. Um, that you have this opportunity to do things that you will be doing when you graduate with, a, with less risk. And let, let, let me say this, the biggest challenge each of you will have when you start managing three people, five people, or 50 people is getting everybody aligned. Alignment is a huge deal. Where are we going? How are we gonna get there? And then you have to ask the last question. You gotta answer the last question. What's in it for you? Every man manager comes in and do, we've gotta change, let's change this. And the employees are going, wait a minute, change? I don't, I don't I like what is going on here. You gotta make the purpose come alive. Why are you changing? What's in, the last question never gets answered. What's in it for the person three steps down the line? to change. Why do they want to change? You've got to get in their skin and make it come alive that they're going to have more job, job security. They're going to get a chance for opportunity with growth. They're going to get a better compensation. Whatever it is, you've got to make come alive for them. Why change? It is your job. So alignment is a huge deal. Too many people go to work without purpose. And that has to change. These numbers are staggering that I gave you before. Yeah. It's staggering. So I, I have a follow-up that's open to any of you. So follow-up on this important question. So one of the problems in management education is that we assign a lot of teamwork. However, the teamwork is then divided up. You do this. Mm -hmm. You do this, you do this, and the act of teamwork is to put these things together figuratively or electronically and staple them together, and this is our team project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the nice thing is you can fix that. How? By getting the team to have one output based on their going back and forth and having a food fight in the room. But they, they can't be in silos doing and clip it together. They've got to have a food fight around the table and show the leadership ability to, to coalesce around where we're going. Okay, first of all, let me just, for, for our students, what I just did, how much of that is accurate? R raise your hands. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm and, then not, it, and then it's the other accurate part because we've got two kids still left in college to we're out but tour in. And what we hear all the time from them is, I'm in a team and two of the people aren't doing the work. And all the rest of it, you know, three of us are doing the work. And it just doesn't, it, it's not like a real team because there, you have no authority and no one has authority. So the whole idea is yes, yes, colleges and business schools want to get kids working together in a team, but there's not the mechanism to make it like a real team in a real work setting. With real mutual accountability. No, what's your there, take? There is a way to deal with that. And, you know, unfortunately, only a few of us do. We, we've been doing action learning sure. projects at Michigan for 20 years, all 480 students, seven weeks, full time. No advertisement, world. just get to the answer. <laughs> but here, go blue. But here's, here's the deal, and I do this, I'm developing action learning in uh, CP in Thailand now, 300,000 person organization. You do not let the teams wander in the desert. Every week, we call up a different member of the team, make them go through goals clear, roles clear, process, interpersonal relationship. 
Grippy. As a coach, Grippy. you yeah. jump in and don't let them get to the end of the game and they never work together. So you stay with, you have to have that. Without that, you get what you deserve. You get that. But if you stay with them, and uh, so the faculty role actually becomes kind of fun because you're dealing with a broken team, helping them get aligned, making sure the product is together, but you can't let them wander in the desert. Wrong. Jack, if the faculty here did that, would you feel like maybe they were doing their better, you know, better job? Absolutely. I mean, the idea of getting these groups, and we put six and eight teams together, and the idea of getting them together and having them wrestle it out mm -hmm. so they have a food fight. I mean, food fights are good. <laughs> Food, food fights are part of getting to the truth again. If truth and trust is the way you're going to run the place, you're searching for truth all the time, and you get it when you have people banging heads together. You get it. And then out of that comes an answer. And hopefully it's the right answer, but at least you got the best. The job of a lead leader is to get, if I took the, this row here, uh, seven or eight people in this row here, if I could get the best of what they know into my head, I'd be a hell of a lot smarter. And that is the game of every leader, to get every mind in the game, because everybody contributes. And they got to feel that. And you as a leader have got to get them doing it. It's your job. And Susie, I assume if that happens, if there are a couple thieves in there, they get flipped. Their fear level goes down. Right, that's right. But you have to have these values. You have to have the values that it uh, that it, there's nothing personal about candor. Jack says food fights are good, and you sort of think, what if there's a jerk? What if there's a person who's who's who just is a? It's all about me in that group. What if there's a person who's trying to who thinks that a, you know holding other people down is going to push them up? Those people exist, and sometimes they're really talented, and they're in your group, and so you got to have a value. That those people get. You know, get out it or get, you know, like, look, you know, this is actually not about you, okay? We all want to win here. So but, I, but, but I would say this, Susie, that's Ted's job and his team's job to lay out what are the values of the students we want here. How do we want them behaving? And if they don't behave in a collegial, open, constructive, truth seeking right. way, kick them in the butt. <laughs> I mean, that's, I mean, I, that's. <laughs> No, but that is what it's about. You've got to set what the rules are. Half pat on the back, half kick in the butt. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. You just Mike, say it. Mike's on its well, way. Well, just say it. So we've got a lot of questions. I'm going to choose one. Right here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Ashley. I'm a first year MBA student here. And so my question is. A lot of us are going to be entering the workforce and we're not going to be managers. We're not gonna have a team and we may have a boss that lacks the generosity gene mm -hmm. or enter a static organization that isn't as open to leadership as, as we may be or you may be. What are your suggestions on us managing up through this process and how do we change a culture of an organization yeah. that doesn't seem to reflect our own values? Probably not easy and probably not doable. Uh, be <laughs> Be smart in your selection, but know you've got this wonderful Yale SOM degree, and you're self-confident. Keep up with the advertising now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but you've got a brand now. You and your degree and what you've achieved, and if it doesn't work out, I quit twice in GE, once in the first, after the first, first year. I got a raise, I got a 10% raise, I was making $10,000. I got $1,000, I was thrilled, until I went back to my bullpen of about six other engineers, and I realized they got $1,000. And I went bonkers, I didn't want to be in a socialistic place. I thought I was, bad, I thought I was better than they were. I thought I was better than they, they were, and I didn't like my race. I, now, I didn't say I didn't like my race, I went out and got another job. And they came, I quit. Had a going away party, and the guy from New York, the guy from New York came up, and convinced me he was going to change my, my life. I didn't have to work for that boss anymore. And uh, the rest is history. But I mean, I, you, yeah. you've got to know that now if you're in a job five or 10 years and you're stuck because you got one of those, you got a more complex situation. You got family obligations, whatever, and it's, it's a, lot, a lot easier. But in the early days, 
get yourself right where you belong, right. and you've got the tools to do it. It really speaks to taking a good, hard look at the culture of the organization you're joining. And you know, it might be, ooh, this is a great job. It's in the industry I want to be in. It's a prestigious company. There's, there's all these things that are going through your head. And at the top of that list, put culture when you're picking. I just want to add Behaviors. one thing to the... Uh, yeah. 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 Culture, behavior. Culture by, beha by the, yeah. beha the values. And, uh, do, just before you go, uh, he's written a lot on bad bosses. So, you, you know, there's a lot in here. Yeah. 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 So, great guidance on that front. I, I do a lot of career workshops for MBAs and for executives. And one of the things I challenge them to think about if you're on the third deck of the Titanic doing great stuff, and you look up at the bridge and you're not confident that they're not going to destroy that, and look at the companies that have gone under, get out. You guys have, you know, are the elite of the elite. Look around the world. You know, may not feel that way when you're waiting for your grades and so forth, but, you know, <laughs> you, you, folks, you folks are very mobile. I say keep an eye on who's up there in yeah. the bridge. And if you don't have confidence in the CEO, get the hell out. OK, who's next? There's, There's right one there. right there. That's a couple. Great. Jack, Susie, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm a second year MBA. Um, so my question would be, like, uh, when you are managing a team, usually there is like smart guys and there's not so smart guys. Those not so smart guys, it, they're easy to manage, but there's, but those smart guys, they put up good, great jobs, but actually like they tend to sometimes think for themselves. So what's your secret in managing the team? Well, I mean, let, let's go back to a very simple principle. You got. When you're looking at the people to evaluate them, you look on one axis, you look at the behaviors they have. Are they aligned with where your mission is, where you're going? Then on the other axis, you look at the performance, the numbers. How are they doing against what they said they were going to do? So you got these two things, behaviors, performance. You got four quadrants, high performance, high behaviors, Kiss them, lug them, hug them, do everything, give them big raises, cheer them on, pat them on the back. Low bottom, low behaviors, low performance, e out. Get rid of them. Now talk, talk to them, love them on the way out as much as you did when you met them, but get them out of your place. They're polluters. Then you go to the um, third type, which is High values, high behaviors, just what you want. Good people on the team, team making, they're, 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 they're valuing all the, the behaviors you want. But they have a lousy performance right now. Well, they might have a sick spouse, they might have a sick kid, they might have any number of things. Give them a second chance, give them a third chance, coach the hell out of them to try and get them up because you want people who want to be on your team and are behaving right. The one that kills every company, and we've got some senior people in the room here too, the one that kills every company, and most companies are guilty of it, is the hoss's ass who has the numbers and the bad behaviors. And, and, the, and the CEO or the manager of the group says, one more quarter, just one more quarter. <laughs> Squeezing it up, <laughs> looking for a number, looking for a number. And, and so, let me tell you one thing as, as you grow up that you're going to have to think about. Every promotion you make is worth 100 speeches. Because guess what? Everybody in your company can draw a curve with their opinion of who are the high stars and who are the bums. So you appoint somebody with bad behaviors and good numbers. They'll kill your company, and you better keep your mouth shut because no one wants to hear you talk anymore. So when you appoint somebody, you say more about yourself and your direction and than anything else in the world. So, so going back to the question about how do you get yourself in the right situation, yep. culture, values, it. I think you have to ask people questions about behaviors. Right. And who's getting ahead? How are decisions made? Who's being rewarded? 
Otherwise, you know, the BS meter might be going off big right. time. Well, but you can't let anybody guess what your values are. I mean, there are too many managers who don't. I mean, I've asked many young people your age coming out, you know, going to a company the first year, what are the values? And they don't know, right? They just have to guess. It's inferred, right? You, but if you're a leader, you've got to say, this, these are the behaviors we value. This is what you're being evaluated on. These, you value speed. You, you share ideas. Uh, you, you, don't kick up and, uh, you don't kiss up and kick down. You've got to be explicit about it. It doesn't happen often enough. And it's OK to push back and, and be a little bit willful when you're really, really smart, as long as, they are not, they're, as long as they're being constructive when they do it and they understand what the values are. I think that's a I think that last point is very important. Tim, uh, we have another question over here. Or I know we had several here. Right here, there's one here. Yes, yeah. right here. Good looking sweatshirt. Yeah, like that. Uh, thank you so much, Jack. Jack Welch. Mr. Jack Welch. I'm so nervous. And actually, I read your book about, your, uh, uh, about winning uh, almost 10, year, uh, 10 years ago. And, uh, but actually, in our life, it's not ab all about winning. Sometimes it's about losing. And uh, could you share, share about some experience how to overcome the uh, setbacks in your life? Thank you so much. Look, you, you, you're not going to win every time. But how well you get back on the horse after you get knocked off is the key. How do you pull yourself together? And we talk in, in this book a lot about in the 2008 period. We had a company called Home Depot Supply that we brilliantly bought in 2007. And it was doing $12 billion of bid business. And in 90 days, it went from $12 billion run rate to a $7 billion run rate. Try that one on for size after our brilliant purchase. And uh, they got whacked. And you can't believe how that team pulled together. They owned it. They changed their strategy for, for process from every six months to, to weekly. So they were constantly looking at the outside world. They, they kept the best people. You know, they didn't go, we've got to cut everybody 10%. Oh, no. They gave raises to the top people and had to take a lot of people out. They took care of them on the way out. But they absolutely kept their best because when you're in trouble, you got to keep your best. You can't go, go, go to war and treat everybody back to that socialism argument again. Weak managers like to say, 10% cut across the board. We're all going to take the pain. Yeah, the good guys are going to say, you take the pain, see you later. <laughs> and, and you can't do that. So there's a whole series of things. But the most important thing is, you know you've got to get back on the horse again. You've got to get up. You own the problem, whatever it became, whether you got fired or whether something else happened to you, and move forward with a new game. What did I learn from that? And how can I be better? Great. There's a question up here. And, and let's cue the next one over here. Who would like a question? Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I have a question, um, uh, again, about the people and the culture. Because uh, I'm a first year a student, so I went to a lot of corporate presentation. And virtually all the firms claim that they have the best culture, and they are people first. I mean, all the banks and consulting firms. So is there anything specific for us to help really identify whether it's truly a great firm in terms of culture? Um, so is there any, yeah. any yeah. tips? Uh, I'll try a couple, and then you try a couple. Uh, tell me about, in the interview process, tell me about what kind of person gets promoted here. So give me a, three examples, if you would, of, of people who got promoted. What characteristics did they have? What, what made you want to promote them? Those are great questions. I mean, I think they're great about when you're looking at a, at a company. Because that's what you're after. You didn't go, go, go there to die in the starting job. So you want to know what it takes, what are the things they're looking for to change the game. Could I add in one, Susie? You, well, you I go just first. Go back to my years as a, as a journalist, as a crime reporter. You just can't trust the source. You can't ask them what their culture is like. They're all so good at PR. They're going to give you all this mumbo jumbo about people first. You got to go around the corner and ask the people who've worked there and do your investigations online. I mean, there's so many great resources online. Our son is just about to graduate uh, next month. Is interviewing in a lot of different companies. There's so many. You go to Glassdoor. You find out what these companies are really like. When I was coming out of Harvard Business School, um, I was. Uh, 
lucky enough to have a couple of offers. And uh, I, I remember trying to find out, you know, what was the difference between Goldman? What was the difference between Bain? I wasn't good enough to go to any of these places, but for some reason they, they were uh, looking around for a lot of people in those days. And um, I remember somebody who uh, had said no to Bain and went someplace else. She said to me, the problem with Bain is that what happens is you work there for a year and it's like you join a cult because they love everybody so much. I thought to myself, I'm in. <laughs> and that's where I went. How, how do you get the real deal on culture? Because I do a lot of career workshops with MBAs. And I'll give you, how, how many of you in this room have called up an alum that's working at a company you're interested in and asked for what's the real deal about working there? Any of you? Yeah. Okay, that's oh, one yeah. window. Good. Great. I also Great. send, I send MBAs out to do a day of shadowing. I've done it with GE and Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. And I set up where an executive is willing to have someone shadow a day in the life of. And you, the deal is you're just going to observe and at the end, feedback session with the executive. So you've got alumni, you've got the possibility of getting in the like do not accept the recruiters yeah. have a storyline and you don't get under the, so be investigative. You got to, and you've got networks. Some of you are already using them, but be really dig in, dig in, don't take one person's view. Now I have a commercial again. Uh, we haven't talked about it, but uh, this is our third book. Uh, we've made over $20 million with these books. Every single dollar goes to inner city scholarship. We're only here hawk hawking the books so we can eat tomorrow. I just want you to know that this cause of, we've got 38 full-time scholarships for inner city kids that change their lives. And I, I don't want you to think that we're out here with a, trying to get 15 bucks off you to try and do something. <laughs> Every penny to charity. Look, Every penny. I, I want to jump on that. No, One actually, of the things Jack did for five quick, years. Quick, though, because we're out of time. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, was developing school principals in New York City for the kids in New York. And he put as much energy into that as the years I saw him at GE, teaching regularly, working with principals, because he believed you get a good school if you have a good school leader. Yeah. I, I got the high sign from good. my right. colleague. Let's right. get the whole but, thing, get uh, us out of here. So, um, get us out of here. <laughs> so, so Susie said that this book was in some ways targeted for people who didn't have the privilege of being here, but I, I suspect that a lot of you uh, might want to crack it open and get some insights as well. Um, but I, I you know, just want to say thank you to uh, my old buddy from, from Michigan who was trying to promote that school. <laughs> but it's got, you know, it's got a great... What can I do? It's got a great uh, <laughs> record, and much of it uh, really derives from your wonderful work there. And uh, Noel, it's great to see you again. Thanks for, for joining Noel Tishy. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Susie, I really appreciate your presence here today and uh, willingness to put up with me and, uh, and Jack. Um, I think, you know, I have to tell you, I think back when I, in my last job, when, when we did the rock star entrance at the, at the Chicago uh, Law School, it almost sort of felt like, you know, you helped make my career. So uh, um, I just, you know, it's great to have you both here and I uh, hope you had a good inaugural, that. you know, business school yeah. debut for your book. And when you go down to Wharton, just, you know, do a lousy job. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thanks a lot.